my sermon this morning begins with a little bit of edginess. The whole sermon isn't edgy. Okay, maybe the whole sermon is a little bit edgy, but the beginning is the edgiest part. I was uh, talking earlier this week with Dana, and for Dana, we thank her for the gift of her beautiful voice this year. Here, here. It's wonderful. <laughs> I was talking with Dana, and Dana asked me about my sermon. Your sermon, Tom, is about spiritual experience. What kind of spiritual experience? Peace, wonder, awe? Actually, I replied a little dryly. It's more like the spiritual experience that Jacob had, by which I mean the spiritual experience of being wrestled to the ground and having your hip dislocated by an angel. And Dana responded, unfazed, that sounds an awful lot like a number of stories from Zen Buddhism. And the next day, in my email inbox, were a handful of stories, a small sampling of stories from the Zen Buddhist tradition, courtesy of Dana's husband, Teshin. Just to give you a taste, I share just one of those stories. The story of Yun Men, one of the great teachers of Zen who lived between the middle of the 9th and the middle of the 10th century. And the story of Yun Men's awakening is one of the classics. After traveling from teacher to teacher following hints and suggestions, Yun Men came to Master Bokushu's solitary hut. He was met by the master himself who opened the door, looked at the student, and shut the door in his face. Yun Men knocked a second time. The master opened the door, looked at him again, and shut the door in his face again. Yun Men knocked a third time. This time, when the master opened the door, Yun Men put his foot in the door jam. <laughs> Bokushu looked down, looked up, and said, speak. Yun Men hesitated, and the master slammed the door shut, breaking Yun Men's foot. At that moment, this is how the story ends, at that moment when his foot broke, Yun Men became enlightened. He would carry the mark of this encounter for the rest of his life as a severe limb. i share just one more Buddhist story with you all. <laughs> Elder Ding asked Master Linji, what is the essence of Buddhism? Master Linji got up from his seat, seized Ding, and slapped him. A monk standing by said, Elder Ding, why don't you bow? As he bowed, Ding suddenly became enlightened. Like I said, my sermon this morning has a little bit of an edgy beginning. But don't worry, I have no intention of recommending wrestling matches, slamming feet in doorways, or slapping as a spiritual practice. And just for the record, I certainly have no intention of practicing them as a spiritual practice. But I've chosen to begin in this edgy way in order to remind us of something about spiritual experience. If you look at stories of spiritual awakening from all the world's religious traditions, you don't find very many stories in which peacefulness and relaxation and affirmation lead to enlightenment. I don't know of a single story in which someone becomes enlightened after taking a nap or enjoying a bubble bath. But there are thousands and thousands of stories in which spiritual experience happens in the midst of discomfort and challenge. Again, I'm not telling you to go slam your foot in the door. But I think this is something to keep in mind when we consider the gospel accounts leading up to the birth of Jesus. These stories are supposed to be challenging. They're supposed to elicit amazement and wonder and awe. They're supposed to be startling and surprising. They are supposed to be uncomfortable and discomforting. There are angels and visions and signs in the heaven. There are babies born after auspicious foretellings that they will save the world and that their service and sacrifice will bless all of humankind. These stories are also replete with dramatic reversals that challenge the systems of status and power and empire and religion. If you don't believe that, 
Go read Mary's Magnificat, and you'll find that it turns everything on its head. These stories are designed to signal a shaking up of things. There is a temptation, a temptation to disenchant these stories, by which I mean to take away some of their power. We can argue against the story scientifically, historically, philologically, rationally, which is a way of trying to deny the story its disruptive power. To say all the parts of it that make us uncomfortable, well, I can explain those parts away. We can take the story for granted and try to domesticate it, which is also a way of trying to deny the story its disruptive power. Or we can take the story seriously, which I believe entails allowing the story to kind of sit with us and be disruptive in our lives, to allow the stories to cause a spiritual disruption within us. What would it mean, I wonder, if we treated the stories in that way? The title of my sermon this morning is a Latin phrase that was a favorite of the great psychologist Carl Jung. And um, between services, Glenn and members of the choir gave me a crash course in Latin pronunciation. So I will do better, but probably not perfect at it. Vocatus atque non vocatus deus adere. Uh, <laughs> called or not called, God is there. Bidden or unbidden, God is present. Now, Carl Jung had this saying not only carved over the door of his house in Switzerland, but he also had it carved on his tombstone. You can imagine if you have a phrase and you carve it over the door of your house and on your tombstone, it's pretty important to you. And I actually keep a plaque with this saying as it appears on Jung's tombstone in my office. I have a plaque. Called or not called, God will be there. At first blush, this saying seems so soothing and so reassuring. The divine spirit is with us always. What a universalist statement. But there's a flip side to it as well, one that isn't as soothing or reassuring, because Jung also imagines a God or a sense of the divine that is there and appears to us at, incon at inconvenient and inopportune times and in unexpected ways. For Jung, God sometimes comes when we do not call and do not invite. Now the great thing about preaching to Unitarian Universalists is that some of us are more theistic than others, and that's a wonderful thing. Theist, for those, uh, is someone who who believes in God or is resonant with the idea of God, and an atheist is someone who's, who doesn't believe in God or isn't resonant with the idea of God. And we've got people in this room who have an important personal relationship with the God of their understanding and who have had experiences of the divine. We've also got people in this room who don't find God a meaningful idea in the least. And we've got people in the room, probably a lot of people in the room, who are somewhere in between those two poles. And that all is a good thing. It's a blessing. So let me, for this morning, provide a little translation help for those of you who struggle with the concept of God or don't find it helpful or meaningful. In this morning's context, here is how I would translate that Latin phrase. I'm taking liberties with this translation. There are things, I would translate the Latin phrase this way. There are things in your life that you don't control. There are things in your life that you don't control, and sometimes things happen, even though you didn't ask for them. That's what I think Jung is getting at with the God comes to us, bidden or unbidden, invited or uninvited, that we're not in control. I really love the story of Zechariah at the beginning of Luke. Zechariah is a priest, and he goes into the holy sanctum of the temple to pray. 
And while he's praying, the angel Gabriel appears to him and tells him that his wife Elizabeth, who had been unable to conceive a child, would become pregnant. And uh, Zechariah's reaction to this is to become startled and kind of doubt and question. And I kind of imagine the dialogue between Zechariah and the angel Gabriel going something like this. I'm going to kind of act it out, and please know that I am not an actor. But over here, we've got Zechariah. And over here, this handsome actor is going to be playing... <laughs> Joe, thank you for laughing. Um, he's going to be playing the angel Gabriel. So, start with Zechariah. I am the angel Gabriel. I'm praying over here. Don't interrupt me. I am the angel of the Lord. Wow. You know, I didn't expect this praying stuff to work like this. Your wife, Elizabeth, will conceive a child. Surely that's impossible. You don't get to decide what's possible. And don't call me Shirley. <laughs> oh, airplane reference. And to remind you that you are not in control, I'm going to make you mute for the next nine months. <laughs> I had a little fun with that. More than a little fun with that. But to me, the story is really a story of profound disruption. Disruption of Zechariah's life, a disruption of what is possible, and a disruption of Zechariah discovering that he is not the one in control. I occasionally have congregants ask me whether I am a theist or an atheist. Actually, congregants almost never ask me that question. Which is kind of funny, don't you think? By the way, and this is a little, a little side note here, a little digression, uh, the Sunday after Christmas, I'm going to be in the pulpit, I'm going to be doing a question box sermon, answering questions posed by members of the congregation. And out in the, the commons today, there's a box, all, all during this month, but today especially, there's a box um, with slips of paper, and you can put questions to me, and then I may preach on your question on December 29th. But I almost never have congregants ask me whether I am a theist or an atheist, which is kind of funny, don't you think? But if you were to ask, here is perhaps what I might say. I find that the times in my life when I am most theistic, the time when God seems most real and most present, are those times in my life when I also realize and am forced to admit that I am really not in control. That in fact, there are all manner of things that are completely outside of my control. So I'm aware that rationally, rationally it does not follow that my not being in control means that God is. But ministry, it seems to me, has actually made me through the years more theistic. Because ministry is a constant reminder of just how much is beyond my own control. And not just beyond my control. I'm called to recognize that which is larger than myself. And it's almost as if to be open to the idea of God. It is first necessary to admit that you're not God. It's almost as if to be open to the idea of God. It's first necessary to remember it. Yeah, you are not God and you are not in control. The story of Jacob wrestling the angel, the stories from Zen Buddhism, the stories of Zechariah and Elizabeth, of Mary and Joseph, the story of the Nativity. All of these stories are profound stories of people who are forced to let go of the idea that they are in control. Think back to that great passage from Annie Dillard that Allison read earlier. Does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we so blithely invoke? 
Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares, should lash us to our pews, for the sleeping God may awake someday and take offense, or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. What Annie Dillard is saying is that if God were to actually show up, bidden or unbidden show up, that things would probably get quite disrupted. So what should we do with all of this? What do we do with all this? Like I said, I don't want to see any wrestling, slapping, or door slamming during coffee hour. I want to see buying things at the bazaar, but not, not slapping. What's more, the types of spiritual experiences I've described throughout the sermon are not something that it is at all possible for any of us to control or command. Vocatus atque non vocatus Deus aderit. Which is to say, the Spirit comes, when the Spirit comes, it's not because we call. I do believe that it is worthwhile to frequently remind ourselves that there is much that we do not control, to practice seeing discomfort as a gift and an invitation, to be open to surprising disruptions, small and large, whenever they occur. If you're interested in doing more with this sermon, I would begin by assigning a little Advent spiritual practice, which is to read the first chapter of Luke. I, I warn you that Allison, when she read it, she read less than half of it. It is probably, I don't think it's the longest chapter in the Bible, but it certainly is right up there. And as you read it, it tells the story of, of Zechariah and, and Elizabeth, remember, Elizabeth, remember, John, it also tells the story of uh, the angel Gabriel appearing to Mary and of Mary conceiving. As you read it, though, pay attention to discomfort. Pay attention to where it is that you feel the most sense of discomfort. And it's perhaps possible that that is where a little bit of the Divine Spirit lives. And also pay attention to disruptions. What is being turned on its head? What is being shaken up in this chapter? Another spiritual practice is to recognize and remember when you are not in control. To have the practice of recognizing things in your life, whether that's somebody that you're having difficulty with, whether that is um, uh, something that, that you're, you're fearful of or something happening in your life, it can be a spiritual practice to recognize and admit, I am not in control of that. And finally is to have this sense of openness. Locatus Atque non vocatus deus adorat. There is a sense to be open to stories of these experiences and to recognize that though they may or may not ever appear in your own life, it's something that you won't really control, but that you can find a sense of comfort with that discomfort. So read Luke 1, practice recognizing not being in control, and realize that whether we ask or not, the Spirit is there. Who knows? Amen. Blessed be. And let us sing our closing hymn of the morning which is number 231, some more Latin for us to sing. Angels we have heard on high, and I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we sing this morning.